Hello friends, this is Self-Critical Automaton, your premium source for aesthetic-based hot takes. And today it's time for yet more Xeno Clash, picking up in the middle of a chapter from where the last one left off, because there wasn't a good place to break it. So let's jump right in. Goldenrod. So, there's a lot I love about this bar, and I'm probably going to wander around inside talking about it for longer than the game really needs me to. Oh, there's actually a load screen here, huh? Guess what? That wasn't in my notes. I must have missed that when I was prepping for this. That's amusing, because that means this would have actually been the perfect place to stop. So, um... I wonder if... Is the door a person, or is this guy just talking through the door? Everybody in Zanzoic knows Hallstone is a mess. Talking to me? Sorry, no rooster blood. Are you crazy? Point that thing somewhere else. Can I help you? Would you like some rooster blood? We're out of anything else. I'm uh, not looking for that today. Also, you just told this guy you didn't have any. So which is it, huh? So, uh, yeah. This brings me to something I've been meaning to talk about for a while, which is that I think there is a direct aesthetic through line between the style of the design of these environments and the uh, environmental designs that go into, or that went into, a lot of older um, point-and-click adventures. Partly in how they look, there were a lot of sort of weird, lumpy environments in those, but part, more in terms of how they... He is, says is he talking hi. to me? He wants to know where you're headed. I need to find Father Mother. <laughs> he says he can help you. Will you take me to her? I'll let you have my backpack. He wants you to follow him. Be warned, stranger. Halstum is not a good place to find friends. Don't say I didn't warn you. I like that the woman outside could tell I was from Father Mother's Brood, but um, she apparently can't. But yeah, so... Um, Quite apart from the eclectic collections of characters, uh, like this guy who looks like if a thumb became a person, and this poor lost submissive looking for someone to hold his chain. Um, the kind of surrealist environmental and character design, I feel like, is something that was a lot more common back in the like the golden age of point and click adventures, and I think that reflects something in the like painterly impulse. There is a kind of a um, just a desire to put interesting little details and strange things to make things look good and interesting to look at, which is, is kind of an art that's been lost to some extent in uh, more modern game design. Although obviously, um, you know, point and click adventures have been quietly doing their own thing for the past 20 years. Oh god, 30 years now? Um, there is this, in a lot of the older ones, there is a kind of a uh, a style, a visual style and also a design style to them, with, with this sort of lumpy weirdness and interesting details everywhere. Everywhere you look there's something interesting to look at. Right down to the mouse hole in the corner. And um, I think that in modern games this impulse has been folded into the concept of environmental storytelling, which is not the same. Um, environmental storytelling gets lauded as being some kind of incredibly clever thing. Nine times out of ten, it's incredibly trite. What I think is much better is environmental detail and letting the details just be. Maybe they mean something, maybe they don't. Um, so many games now, it's just boring corridors, and they all look the same. Uh, so it's nice to dip back into something that was itself dipping back into an era where there was just a lot of weird shit to look at. Also, I like that she just, like, squawks at you if you get too close. So yeah, let's move on. Yep. 
Yeah, yeah. God? Why did you bring him here? It's my baby. Don't let him get near my babies. It's a nice little touch, um, but I really appreciate that they included sign language in Dane Other's speech. It makes sense that a giant elephant man might have trouble speaking in, in, in ordinary whatever they speak in Xenozoic. Um, so it's just a nice little inclusive touch that apparently one of the characters in this game uses sign language. You know? That won't stop us kicking seven shades of shit out of him with an enormous... What is this, like a forge hammer or something? Um, but, you know, that's what the game is, that's what we do. Oh, hey, look, Father Mother's watching. Hmm. So, uh, I want to jump back to inside that bar for a second, uh, conceptually, and uh, mention something I mentioned before, which was that the designers of this game took a visual design first approach, and apparently that's something that's just true of them as a studio in general. They designed the characters and then they thought, hmm, this character looks like they would have a personality like this. And then based on their ideas about what that person's personality might be, they gave them mechanics for the combat encounters. Um, but this also tied itself into a very open kind of development where sort of things were freely recontextualized and like altered throughout the game design process. So, you know, characters that they thought were interesting, but that people decided before would be removed or replaced, and so on. Um, this is most strongly reflected with Father Mother, who is one of, you know, obviously the most critical characters in the game. Although they're not in it very much, they are... Oh boy. Uh, although Father Mother's not in the game tons, they are the, you know, primary motivation for the main character. They are critical to the plot and just an interesting entity in their own right. Given all of that, um, you'd think that maybe that, that character was designed first, or one who got a lot of, you know, time and effort in the development process. That's completely untrue. Father Mother was originally just a background character in the bar, and in one of the early demos, people thought, uh, huh, that's interesting, this weird bird-like creature sitting at a table with a baby in front of it. What's going on? Is it going to eat the baby? Is that its baby? What's up with this? So, um, the team concluded, well, this is an interesting character, let's give them more of a role in the plot. And then that just sort of went on from there until it ended up the way it is. I do think uh, it's an interesting way to design a game, although it's not necessarily ideal. There's a similar, possibly for different reasons, because no one really knows why they do this, but there's a similar impulse in um, From Software. It's well known amongst the fans that FromSoft, for some reason, tend to shuffle everything around and recontextualize everything towards the end of their game design process. Why they do this, no one knows. It often actually makes for some, for less, for some less good parts of those games. Uh, a lot of the worst parts of... Um, the Dark Souls games are from times when, you know, oh, this box makes sense in this environment. This environment makes sense with this item in it. Let's, for some reason, recontextualize those. Let's move this boss to an environment that isn't matched for it. I also, I, I was intending originally to, to say a bit of a thing about how I appreciate that um, the brawling is sort of broadly equal gendered. You know, you can kick the shit out of women as much as you can out of men, but that's not really true. Because, um... Why did you think I'd want to hurt you? Why couldn't I come here? He didn't know. But why are you here? It's too late now. You must go away. Go away with your new family, the Corwits. You cannot stay with us anymore. After that, Father Mother told my family and the Northern Gate Gang 
that I was a Corward, not allowed to get near anymore. No one was allowed to speak to me either. Why did Father Mother get so upset? I figured it out later, but I can't tell you why. But that's the whole point of telling me the story. I just won't tell you. Okay. Why is it so dark? I'm not even sure if it's supposed to be day or night now. So I want to point out something about that cutscene really quickly, which is just that it's a really nice flourish the way that Father Mother simultaneously uh, looks away from Gat, thus indicating, you know, confusion and separation but is also then looking directly at the camera to break the fourth wall and indicate in this aside uh, that the fact they're saying is actually extra important to our understanding of the plot, so we need to remember that. Father Mother thought Gat learnt something, but Gat did not learn something. And the confusion over that is uh, ultimately the fact responsible for a lot of things. So this is one of the only genuinely creepy sequences in the game. Um, it definitely was creepy to me when I played this when I was 19, which, you know, isn't saying much because I was kind of a kind of a weak ass 19 year old. But um, I think there is genuinely something fascinating about these designs. I love the the tortured way they stagger, the sound of tearing metal as they move or get hit. Uh, it also introduces a completely new set of mechanics that appear in in this and only this sequence. Um, I don't think they're used anywhere else in the game. But this environment is also this useful because it, it highlights what I was saying last episode about the game looking a hell of a lot like uh, an old point of adventure. It's most noticeable with chapters like this, or the Hastum chapter, but too many of them. these very much look like... It's almost as if you were playing through the backdrop of a, um, of a point and click adventure game. And I think that's really cool. I think that's a really interesting visual. It's like getting to walk inside one of the, one of the painting backdrops of one of those old games. But the way they scream... The way their eyes gently drop out of the air. It's quite horrible. And um, the weirder things get, the less comfortable it is that nothing is explained. Which is also cool. I personally love the feeling that um, Gat and Deidre have fled their problems so far. They've run away so hard that they've actually found the edge of the world. They've found where reality is starting to break down. A lot of these things are actually explained in detail in the sequel, which I think is a weakness. I have not finished the sequel, I haven't got very far in it even because of... Um, I think they made some design problems that meant it just wasn't very fun for me to play. But given that, I think that... Also, I mentioned uh, previously about the stock sound effects in the game. The sound effect of those things appearing I've heard in so many games. I've heard them in... This is just too much. Uh, I've heard them in a lot of things, but probably most notably Warcraft 3, where I think it is the noise where you select a wisp unit. Or at least it's very similar. But yeah, these strange tortured creatures, the way they creak and... It's like, they're very much like the ghosts of broken metal. Um, 
which, you know, you can just... You know, I'm confident in my opinions. They are very much like the ghosts of, of tortured, broken, rusting metal. Left to rot. Um, and uh, that's completely unprovable because that's just an aesthetic opinion. But then I did say that was my whole deal, so suck it. I'm, as I said before, you can just leave Deirdre, she'll be fine. Um, they can't kill her, just knock her down. These are probably what would be zombies in almost any other game, but this game's determination to be different and weird and, you know, as I've said a bunch now, reflect those older games, um, I think is really neat. You know, I've never played a game that had creatures that looked and sounded like this. The way they pulse and ripple, as well as their ridiculous, um, staggering and collapses. As I was saying about the inferences you can make, it seems fairly likely that this is some primordial place. Something from some before time that should not exist in the world and yet somehow still persists. Some remnant of something horrible, maybe. Um, I think that given all of that. Look ahead! In the fog! It's some kind of path! I don't want to step into the fog. It hurts my feet. I'll go first and see if it leads somewhere. You stay close to the light. Don't take too long. Come back as soon as you can. Actually, there's something I want to pick up on, which is that the way the game is written and acted uh, gives the characters as kind of a fascinating naivete. There's something about the way they talk, the way they act, the way, that, the way they speak and behave that makes me think of... It's hard to describe. It's almost childlike. But it's not. I think I think the what it reflects to me is something primordial. I think these people look and sound and maybe act as if almost they were early human entities. Their way of being makes me think of what I imagine humans fifteen thousand years ago might have been like. This kind of Desperate scrabbling to understand things that are beyond your comprehension and acceptance of things that you do comprehend. This kind of reaching, grasping, simultaneous comprehension and incomprehension. I think it's... It's fascinating and I don't know how to describe it well, but I definitely think it has something. Just walking in a straight line, like oximeter, and no, wait. The way they phrase things, the way they contextualize things to each other, I think all of these things play into it in some respect. Anyway, uh, this is the start of the next chapter, so this is actually going to be where I, uh, where I call it for today. That's going to be all from me. Thank you so much for watching. I'll catch you later. Bye! I hope you enjoyed this episode. Please remember to like and subscribe and check out the links in the description. Thank you so much for watching.